in all arenas of life. Thank you for that. We explore the ADA to see where we can provide advocacy and awareness in all realms, whether that be employment or education, so that you may be aware of your rights and access all for your needs. Chris, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Trey. Uh, my name is Chris Magaha. I am uh, a sign language interpreter here in Alabama. I work uh, primarily in K-12 settings, and I also work um, in the VRS setting. Um, I have a background in education, and then um, I've been working with adjacent space kind of in the behind the scenes with some grant writing and just some think tank, op, you know, discussions about adjacent space. And I'm just excited to be here and be part of this discussion. All right. Thank you, Chris, for introducing yourself. I've known Chris for a long time, many years since I was very young. And I have a lot to say thank you to him for. Um, a lot of gratitude for Chris. So let's introduce Ed Zwilling. Ed is our ADA attorney. And uh, Ed, if you don't mind, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, thank you. First off, I wanna say I'm really glad Chris is here because we have somebody with actual experience with this. And my experience, uh, while I have represented uh, uh, numerous people with hearing impairments in education and public accommodation discrimination, whether it's at the, the doctor's office or at a hospital um, or work, what have you, um, I, I haven't gotten very much involved in uh, education matters uh, in the K through 12 setting. I, I have had cases to remove architectural barriers for, for kids with physical disability, disabilities um, and also adults who want to attend those schools and they're not, and, and they're architectural barriers. But, um, you know, the whole IEP thing and the IDEA, I'm very familiar with it and made, after studying the law a lot, uh, made the determination that it was a very risky area to practice in <laughs> and there's not a lot of attorneys that do. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm glad to be here and hopefully I can, I can offer some insight into how the law works. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ed. I appreciate you going through that introduction and, uh, we are definitely going to touch on many different topics. We've got a variety of questions here. And if you feel like there's a question that uh, we're addressing and it might apply very close to your heart, just maybe put that in the back of your mind and keep in mind this webinar. And you can always go back and watch it again. Also, we want you to share your questions that you have, or if there's anything that you would like more information on and clarity, you can type that in the chat. I'll get that question and we'll pose that to Ed on your behalf. All right, without further ado, let's begin. So, so to start off, Ed, we have IEPs and 504s, and I wonder if you can differentiate those two for us. Yeah, I'd be glad and to. Then also, if you could tell us what those, if what is the, uh, how they relate to effective communication in specific. Yeah, yeah, no, happy to do it. So um, if you look at it um, chronologically through kind of like the, uh, the, the, the lens of uh, disability civil rights laws as they were passed, the um, Rehabilitation Act was, I think the second, um, and it was passed in 19, I want to say it was either 72 or 73. I want to say 73. But um, before that, we had the Architectural Barriers Act. And if you were to look at that law, it required um, federal uh, buildings to be constructed in accordance with the uniform federal accessibility standards. That went back to 1968. And so the next step from looking at that law 
was the Rehabilitation Act, and that's where Section 504 is. And it expanded uh, disability civil rights to any program, service, or activity that was receiving federal financial assistance. So when you think about well, what all gets federal money, you have the Department of Education, um, which, which gives money to schools. And those, that, that money comes with strings, just like the Department of Transportation, um, the Department of Health and Human Services. So, you know, if you go to a hospital and you're a Medicare beneficiary, that's federal money. So that hospital's governed and subject to 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Same is true if you go to a public school and they get federal money. And so the 504 plan was the way to ensure that that program was not discriminating on the basis of disability. And so it's not limited simply to students, you know, because it, it could be broader. It could have, you know, it, it, it could might need a 504 plan for your sidewalks, you know, and things like that. But um, the IEP, on the other hand, comes from the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And uh, that law actually goes back to 1975 and it predates the ADA. Um, and initially it was, I think a very powerful tool, but in the uh, early 2000s, I wanna say it was 2004, they amended the law with the, um, it, it, it's, it's abbreviated IDEA, but it became the um, Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act. They added the I to IDEA. And it was not an improvement. <laughs> it brought it in line with no child left behind. And it, it created a much more cumbersome enforcement structure and introduced a lot of financial burden on parents who want to take on a school district to litigate for what they believe is a free and appropriate education. And so the difference is the 504 plan basically is you can't discriminate on the basis of disability in a federally funded program. And it's very broad. And I, uh, uh, the, the, ID, I, the idea, the IDEA, is looking at ensuring that a children with a, with, that has a, that a child with a disability is getting a free and appropriate education. Um, the, when you look at the goal of the ADA, it's maybe, in, in my view, a little bit more of a powerful law because you're looking at equality and integration and you don't want to be segregated. Um, and, and, and treated separately. And you have these ideas of least restrictive environment and things like that. I'm not sure that all of those ideas translate into the, um, into the, into the idea setting. Um, and so the, dif the difference between an IEP and a 504 plan, um, they're, really, they're really in a way kind of one in the same thing. And, and a lot of times people have just used 504 plan as a terminology when really it's an IEP. <laughs> um, I'm not aware of a lot of situations where you would have both or you would have one and not the other. Um, however, you know, once you're out of 12th grade and you go to a college, um, uh, you know, you're going to uh, secondary education or postgraduate education, you know, there is no idea anymore. It's just a K through 12 thing. It's a public school thing. And so then you're just dealing with the Rehabilitation Act. Um, but the enforcement mechanisms are totally different. And that's, um, in a way, I think a 504 plan is, um, the, the Rehabilitation Act is a stronger uh, uh, tool in your toolbox. You can get more accomplished through the Rehabilitation Act, I think, than you can through IDEA. Um, and, and I have a, I have a reason, <laughs> I have a reason why I'm saying this. And Chris, by all means, you chime in if you disagree with anything that I'm saying in your experience. But I was involved peripherally with a case that really, really irked me. And I, I don't want to put um, any particular school system on the spot. But basically, I was contacted and I, uh, by parents of a child um, who used a wheelchair and she was like in the eighth grade and she was going to be matriculating to this high school that they knew was not accessible at all and it needed a lot of work and so they wanted to get the school system to make changes so that their child could could enjoy you know going to high school with her peer group um, and uh, so I involved ADAP which if you live in Alabama that's your federally mandated protection and advocacy organization PNA 
Um, and uh, they do a lot of special education and IEP work. They, make, they do a lot of advocacy at IEPs for parents of kids with disabilities. And they're, they're really an invaluable resource. And so I, rec I recommend them to you. And if you live in another state, you should research the PNA organization in your state because every state has one and, and they really truly are um, invaluable. So um, they took on the case and filed it and they used my expert. And um, they went through the school and did a big report as to all the things that needed to be changed, parking, bathrooms, doors, you know, desks, at the whole, the computer lab, the library, everything, auditorium, the football stadium. And um, the school system fought back and the judge in the case said, you know, um, you bring this case under the ADA and under the ADA, you can make these arguments, but the ADA isn't the primary law that governs this case because it's brought on behalf of the student. Um, it's the it's the IDEA that is, and under the IDEA, the school can um, you know send you to a different. They can send you somewhere else. You know they can give you resources so that you could go to a private school. You could be homeschooled, and the school could provide resources. And so that's what they're choosing to do, which basically acted to segregate that child from her peer, from her peer group, from her friends, and really deprive her of that whole high school experience that she was looking forward to. I thought it was a horrible decision and the Department of Justice wanted to appeal it, but the, um, uh, you know, the, the ADAP didn't have the budget to do an 11th Circuit appeal. So that, that still stands. Um, I don't think it constitutes precedence, but it's persuasive authority in Alabama, and I think it's a horrible decision. So um, what I have done when I've had those situations is I have brought those cases not on behalf of the student, but on behalf of a parent with a disability, a grandparent with a disability, somebody who's going to be attending those functions that needs access. Now, when you're dealing with um, communication, it's a very, it's a, it's a very different um, it's a very different thing. And I think Chris is here is, is evidence that, um, you know, children that have hearing impairments and have hearing impairments and require some sort of communication accommodation, um, you know, are getting that. Um, but, you know, what accommodation um, they're entitled to, I think it's not a one size fits all thing. It's based specifically on the needs of the child. What are the child's abilities? What, uh, you know, what disabilities do they have? Uh, and what can be done to, um, you know, to, to give them a free and appropriate education, which is the guiding standard of the idea. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I did notice we have a comment in the chat and it states that there is special protection with IDEA in regards to LRE. So I wonder if you might uh, expand a little bit on where that fits, LRE and IDEA. Okay, someone tell me what LRE is an abbreviation for. Least restrictive environment. Oh yes, 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 least restrict, yes, absolutely. And least restrictive environment, um, you know, it. There is a, a landmark case, and it has to do really, really more with um, people with mental impairments. But you see, historically, people with hearing impairments had been lumped in and institutionalized with people who had, you know, uh, psychological problems. And uh, the least restrictive environment, um, God, it, what? I cannot remember the name of the landmark case, but it's a, it's a Supreme Court case. That, that actually had to do with, with getting people out of institutions who were institutionalized when they really had the ability to function outside of an institution. Now, least restrictive environment can come into play in special education, which, you know, I'm, I'm 55 years old and I don't know how old our, our, our audience is, but, you know, I feel that, um, people are getting services more frequently now than they were when we were kids, <laughs> even though the I IDEA was still there. But um, historically, special education, you know, kids who were getting special education were segregated from the classroom and lumped all lumped together in the special ed classroom where arguably they weren't getting the same education 
that the kids who were in the in the core curriculum were getting. And so I what IDEA says is that you know a kid with a with a disability should be in the least restrictive environment. And basically, um, you know, a, a, as part of the common, as much a part of the common school as that as that child can be. Um, and so that means that what you will see, and I, I'm sure Chris can attest to this, is you're going to see interpreters in the classroom, not just a special ed classroom, but in the main classroom, helping uh, a child with a disability who is not being segregated from, from the school or, or from his peer group or her peer group, as the case may be, if, if that's what you're asking about. Um, that's where that comes from, though. And it'll, that case is going to come to me. I was involved in a reverse version of that case and um, where where they were denying services to somebody who needed them <laughs> and we were trying to get them back in the back basically in the institution because they needed it and uh, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on the case name but that's all right I appreciate you getting into that um, more in depth thank you Chris did you want to talk about that a little bit more or you have thoughts Sure, I'd love to. Uh, just from my experience within the education setting and talking with those that are in deaf education, um, often the least restrictive environment for deaf kids because deaf students is dealing with language. Um, often in mainstream public schools, you put an interpreter in the classroom from a special ed perspective, that's least restrictive. But for the deaf student, they only have access to language with that interpreter. So it really becomes the most restrictive sometimes, depending on the language needs of the student and the, qual the qualifying factors of that interpreter, if they are qualified enough to work with that student. Um, and so in some national deaf education groups, they've changed LRE, not from the law, but just within their groups to mean for deaf students, language rich environment, that the push should be for deaf students to have a more language rich environment that's more visual and equitably accessible, not just through an interpreter. So I think sometimes that's where the push is for deaf students to go to a deaf school versus just going to the public school where their family lives. Um, and I think that case could be fought if, I'm not sure if there's ever been a case like that, but that's just the discussion kind of in deaf education world about that aspect. But again, I think if you have a qualified interpreter, especially a qualified team of people that's working with a deaf student that are familiar with language assessments and, and interpreting and what that really looks like with a student that's learning language and learning content, I think, um, I think it can be effective. Uh, it just has, there's a lot of factors I feel that need to play into it, especially when it comes to communication and language. Can I ask a question of Chris? Because <laughs> you raised something that, 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 that just sparked something in me. And I'm curious, in your, in your experience, when you're there for, for a, a deaf child, are you not just interpreting in the classroom, but are you also interpreting for the child when he's at lunch, sitting with his friends or on the playground? playing a pickup game of basketball? Are you there to help him or her engage with peers? Because that's that's so much of what I see of segregation, especially for, for uh, deaf kids. Well, I think again, like, so I'll go at it from an IEP perspective. If an IEP is written in, in the school system that I work in, we write interpreter is available across all academic settings because the reason we do that, if the student goes to the restroom and there's something that occurs in there and the interpreter's not in there, then it falls back to the IEP. But from an equitable, least restrictive environment, as an interpreter, I should be interpreting everything when they walk down the hall, when they're on the bus, but that is impossible to do as one interpreter. It, it is. So if you think about the amount of incidental learning that occurs in a a typical hearing student's life from K to 12, deaf kids do not have access to that. And so there's been a lot of research study about incidental learning and the impact that it has on deaf kids and how interpreters can incorporate more of that into their work. 
But again, still, you, I mean, you're talking about having one, a really qualified interpreter that knows language development, knows deaf ed, knows student development, and then knows the language to be able to take that and process it and put it out for the deaf student. And then just the amount of time that's needed. Um, I, I, my personal experience, I interpreted sports for several years in the school system that I'm in. Um, and I had just a great team of coaches that I worked with that were just like welcomed the deaf student, welcomed uh, the interpreter as part of their team. So I interpreted everything, all conversations in the locker room. I interpreted all conversation. I mean, and it was just a, uh, uh, but even then it's not a hundred percent. And right. so anything less than a hundred percent is, is it effective? I don't know how you measure or quantify effective communication when it comes to that law and how you tell a school system that they're not providing that when they're paying for interpreters. So that's just, I don't know if that answered that question or not. <laughs> no, therein lies the devil. That's right. That's, that's the detail. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. All right, we have another question, uh, comment here from Andy Homestead. Hill. Yes, it was the Homestead case. Thank, That's yes, exactly right. I think it was Homestead. There you go. That was it. You're right. You're right. And I've, I've been involved in a couple of reverse you, Homestead cases, <laughs> trying to get services where people are being denied them. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to our next question. Um, this has been a great discussion so far. And Andy, thank you so much for that contribution as well. In terms of uh, language and language assessment, how should schools be determining what is truly effective communication for students? And then further, how does the ADA define or explain for a school to determine effective communication and then individualize that in their education plan. Right, well, let me talk about that just briefly for what I do when I file an ADA case and how I prove that effective communication has not been provided by whether it's an employer or whether it's a, um, you know, a, a doctor's office, a hospital, what have you. And then Chris can chime in as to what his experience has been with regard to what, what type of assessments the schools are doing, because honestly, I don't know. But what I have an expert who is a professor of linguistics up in Maine, and um, she works with a lot of other deaf PhDs. And that's, that's basically her whole research is, um, is kind of, deaf rhetoric for lack of a better word and what she does is a is a is an assessment that takes about two days and it involves everything from watching a video and then signing what you saw happening and then watching a different video and then having to write in english what you saw happen and then if if you have if they have the ability to speak to speak it in english what they saw happening um, and just a whole host of tests, a whole host of uh, trying to communicate um, ideas and concepts in different methods, both with sign language, both verbally and, and written. And then she is able to quantify that to, uh, to really show the need and the amount of stuff that's missed <laughs> when you don't have it in, in sign language, if sign is the, is the actual primary language. And of course, there are also people that are lip readers and they might need a different type of interpreter so that they can better see what's being said. But, uh, but for sign language, those have been the cases that I've handled. That's, um, that's what I've used. Um, and, and you know, without that, I wouldn't be able to prove that the communication wasn't effective. But if I have an expert that's able to testify that, you know, she's got a PhD in this and she gave two days worth of testing to, to my client and they comprehended, you know, 25% of what was said to them and, and you know, 15% of what was written. Um, but when the same information was given to them by sign language, they got 100% of it. I think that's pretty persuasive. 
Um, but I'm not really sure that students um, are, are get that that same stuff that same have that same resource as a matter of course, and I defer to Chris. Uh, well, let let me preface this to say that. Um, I, well, I was just going to add just a excuse me a brief anecdote. My own experience going to the Alabama School for the Deaf. I look back on those years, and I recall in the first grade and the second grade, I was required to take speech pathology or speech therapy course um, with no speech skill. And so I had to wear the large hearing aid and the FM system. It created a vibration when there was sound that came in, but there was truly no recognition of those sounds. Nonetheless, I was required all through grade school to attend the speech therapy course and practice those hearing skills. Again, regardless of the fact that I had no speech skills and no hearing skills to start with. So it was, it was based on a fail, a pass fail. And in my IEP at my school, my parents decided to remove me from speech the speech therapy classes. And again, it may have been some um, changes in the school there and the system and how they approach speech therapy. But that was four years of training that I went through and the course that I went through. And I think, do they look at the students and determine, okay, this student has potential, let's continue with them. Do they look at a student at some point and say, clearly this is ineffective for this student and then release them from the course. So I'm curious how that is approached. Um, Ed, Chris, Chris? Chris, you take that. Well, um, I, I, I wanna preface just to say that I, I am an interpreter. Um, I, I'm not a psychometrist, like I don't do the testing, um, but my observations from the school system that I'm in here in Alabama um, is that a deaf student comes in wherever they are, immediately the first thing is we need to hire a sign language interpreter. And there's not a, we need to do a language assessment and see where this deaf student is um, to see can they utilize an interpreter. And, and I think if you say, if you go that route, then what assessments are there? Um, first of all, I would love for, for your PhD person to come and do assessments on all the deaf kids that, that are in our system, just because I would love to see where they're at. And, but we in the school system I'm in, we, so let, let me say this. So there are, I feel like there's two views of deafness. There's a cultural view and a medical view. Medical view is we fix this, we provide cochlear implants, we provide hearing aids, and that's a tool to effectively gain language with the hope that it be speech. Um, and like Trey was saying, a lot of deaf kids in mainstream schools, well, he went to the school for the deaf, but in mainstream schools, they get speech services, even though they're fully dependent on sign language and visual language, that's their first natural language. And so that's to right. me, it's a detriment to trying to fit services in that don't fit the student. So have we assessed the students effectively? <clears throat> I, I don't think there is effective assessments going on across the nation in K-12 mainstream schools with deaf students. Um, I think in some states, there's a lot of partnering with the local school for the deaf to do outreach to those students and provide testing. I think some of that happens here in Alabama. I think um, from what I've seen in our system, We've used a, a test um, informally called the um, sign language or ASL receptive skills test. And it's only normed from K to age 13, but it really looks at the different parameters of ASL and how well deaf, that deaf student is receptively seeing that language. And if they're high on that at receptive end, they're probably scientifically based on that research could utilize an interpreter more effectively than if a deaf student comes in and, and doesn't do well on that test. So in my, you know, if school systems have a deaf student and they're doing assessments on language, 
appropriate for the deaf student. Because I'll say that too, there's a lot of teachers I've seen, deaf teachers of the deaf, that do assessments using tools that are norm for kids that are hard of hearing and have speech. And they use those same tests on deaf students who are ASL users, and it, it doesn't correlate appropriately. And so therefore, we're back to the same thing. We just provide an interpreter. And then there's a burden put on the interpreter a lot of times in K-12 to do a lot more out of the scope of interpreting with that student. And that's a whole nother topic of discussion on the role of the educational interpreter. But I think assessments are critical if um, there are parents on here listening, like asking your IEP team what assessments are being done to assess yes. my student is from a language beginning point, and then how are they progressing? How are you assessing their language growth um, effectively? Yeah, if I could speak to that just real briefly, I don't want to take up too much time, but I think what Chris just hit on is really key to every single IDA issue. Now I'm not just talking about deaf issues, I'm talking about the whole gamut is that the parents really need to be involved. And when I first started doing civil rights work for people with disabilities, um, I met a woman mm -hmm. who was a teacher and her child uh, had cerebral palsy. And uh, I'm just gonna call her Smith So for, for this little anecdote, but she, she told me, you know, it was before my child came home from the hospital, um, you know, whenever I was walking to the nurse's station or going to talk with the doctor, um, I could see from the look on their face that they're thinking, oh no, here comes Mrs. Smith. And it's kind of like, you have to be that way <laughs> to make sure that your kid is getting the free and appropriate education. And it's not because the school doesn't have the best, um, you know, the, 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 the doesn't want to do what's best for the kid. They do, but a lot of times they don't know. They don't have the resources to determine. Um, and it, it creates, this is my biggest problem with the IDEA is that kids of parents with less means end up getting less services than kids of parents with more means. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, the kids of parents with means, they have the ability to get their kid tested. They have the, they know that maybe their kid needs an occupational therapist. Whereas, you know, the kid of a parent of limited means might not even know what an occupational therapist is. Um, and so they don't even know to ask, which is why I think it's key that you have an advocate with you when your IEP meeting. Uh, and I would recommend that you start with the uh, Alabama Disabilities uh, Advocacy Program at the University of Alabama, our state federally funded PNA, but there's also like the Special Education uh, Action Committee, SEAC, I think they're called, and there, and there are other um, advocates. And I'm sure there are some out there that I don't know of that specialize in advocating for kids with hearing impairments. Um, but I really feel that that's, that's what a parent should have on their side, um, because I think that the school wants to do and, and if you ask for it, you might get it. <laughs> if you don't ask for it, you're probably not gonna get it. Yes, and Andy has made a comment here in the chat saying that you absolutely have to be that parent. IDEA gives parents a place on the IEP team that is equal to every other member on the team. So it's imperative that parents attend and know what is best for your child. You do know what is best for your child more than anyone else there on that team. So it's vital that parents are participating in those IEP meetings. And it is vital that we get those things in writing because that's what's going to hold up in court when it comes down to their intent and what's being communicated with the team between the IEP team and then the parent. Well, let's move on to our next question. We've been talking about language and effective communication. So I want to talk a little bit about um, fundamental alterations and undue burden, just a little bit. 
So in regards to public school, not private school, but in public school and public services being provided to all children, um, accommodations such as interpreters, wheelchair accessibility, specialized programs. We understand that these services can be expensive. And there are times when the schools may feel that providing such services is a significant alteration to their program, to their courses, and then also just the expense of those. Can you speak to those, Ed? Sure, sure. Those are uh, difficult. I got to say that they will make that argument a lot, but those are difficult arguments to actually prove in court. Undue burden is a very, very high standard. Um, uh, you know, I've had cases against uh, government agencies under the ADA now, not in the education system, where they agreed to do what amounted to tens of millions of dollars of work to make facilities accessible to everybody. You know, and I'm talking like visual fire alarms, uh, braille signage, open captioning on monitors, assisted listening devices, plus, you know, ramps and accessible parking and doors and bathrooms and the whole thing. And, and this can get very expensive. And um, I've never had a defendant actually try and make that argument in court to basically say, no, we're not gonna agree to do anything because we think this is unduly burdensome. I think that once they once they look at the case law, they realize that that's a really difficult uh, road to hoe. But that being said, I do think that it's going to vary significantly based upon, you know, the resources in this case of this of the school district. And so I, I would I would be surprised if, you know, a school system, say like Vestavia, that has its own foundation, you know, the, the taxes you pay if you live in Vestavia are so much higher because they contribute to their school. And when they have those referendums to vote on about raising their taxes to provide more, more money for school, they vote yes, <laughs> which when you're out in rural Alabama, they don't do that, they vote no. <laughs> and, and people are giving more money to their school foundation. Um, and so, you know, when my kids were in Vestavia, every single kid in like first grade got their own laptop, um, which is unheard of when you are in rural Alabama. That just doesn't happen. So, um, so yeah, I think that that the means of the school system are are always going to be an issue. And now, as far as fundamental alteration, I have seen that used, and. Um, for example, I've seen it used where a child wanted to have a, 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 a dog in class. I want to say in, in the case that I had, it wasn't like a hearing ear dog or whatever you call it. It was a um, it was actually like a diabetic, um, you know, a scent dog that could that could that could determine a high or low. And, um, you know, there was an issue of whether having that dog there. It was actually it was a, it was a teacher it wasn't a student. It was a teacher who wanted to have the dog. And they didn't want her to have the dog in the classroom thinking that it would be a distraction to the, ch the, to the, the children, that they wouldn't be paying attention, that they'd just be looking at the dog. Um, and so it didn't fall under IDEA, it fell under Title I of the ADA because it was an employment discrimination. So it's a totally different type of analysis. But um, I would, you know, I would be interested to hear Chris's, if he's ever been in a situation where, you know, the, the school didn't want to provide an interpreter. Um, I, I think that um, often for students, um, providing an interpreter is what the schools do, whether it's through a contract agency or hiring someone on staff. Um, I do think that uh, I'm not sure how effective school systems are within themselves to determine the qualifications of an interpreter. Here in Alabama, to interpret for numeration, to get paid to interpret. Um, you have to have a license or a permit. Um, and there's not a distinguishing factor for K-12. So um, unless the school system says specifically, we want them to do this assessment like the EIPA or the Educational Inter Interpreter Performance Assessment, there's not a requirement for that. All that 
in Alabama, again, <laughs> here, it's just a license or a permit. Um, so they can hire interpreters um, and they do, school systems do that. Um, when the interpreters are available, that's another thing. One of the things that I think I see come up or in two areas is um, after school activities. If a deaf student decides to participate in those activities, um, the schools should provide an interpreter for that. Um, and they should bear the burden of financially to provide that interpreter. Um, and I, you know, I've seen that come up before um, as well as, the, and this probably I think falls under more ADA, when a parent that's deaf chooses to attend a school function, maybe it's a deaf grandparent, um, it could be a deaf parent of a deaf child that wants to attend that, um, the school's trying to figure out how to provide an interpreter, maybe even utilizing the interpreters they have there. Um, I have a little bit of a beef personally with that because I feel like my <clears throat> funding source falls under special ed funds, which are allocated funds earmarked for special ed, yet they're trying, they're wanting to pull an interpreter from a setting for a child to go interpret for a parent. And, you know, I'm sure, I'm not sure that's the, that's the most appropriate thing. Um, so those would be the two areas where I feel like there's some pushback sometimes from school systems. Um, and that's just generally speaking. With regard to extracurricular activities, that's an example of the type of thing that really should be in the IEP because <laughs> that ends up becoming the law of the case. Um, so um, if it's in the IEP that, you know, your deaf child is playing baseball and so the interpreter needs to be there for all baseball practices after school and, and at the games and so on and so forth, then, then that's going to be provided. But if it's not in the IEP, I think that could well be balked at. And I think Did you get that, the baseball pun balked that. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Man. I, I think Ed, <laughs> too, like that goes back to parents having advocates and having somebody that's an outside expert and an outside person that's not directly involved emotionally that can right. really look at this from what does the law say is appropriate, effective, and the right of your student. So. Exactly, exactly. I have seen cases where the school district and the parent end up getting in a battle of experts. And unfortunately, I've seen that the courts will tend to defer to a school district's expert over a parent's paid expert. But I still think that it can be a worthy investment because in many cases, uh, it, it, the school is just, of a fr just afraid of having to get attorneys involved and incurring a big expense as the parents are. And if the parent is coming armed with an expert and an advocate to the IEP, they're much more likely to go on and concede than they are to draw a line in the sand and set themselves up for a legal battle. Thank you. I noticed uh, Andy mentioned something here in the chat for Chris saying, does Alabama not adhere to the EIPA standards? So um, in Alabama, the licensure law, the way it's currently written is you can get, you, you, to interpret in Alabama for pay in any setting, you have to have a license or a permit. There is a one-year non-renewable provisional that are a, a provisional permit that's provided that's for students. It was intended for students coming out of interpreter training programs to go ahead and get that, have mentoring and support and work toward some type of certification and assessment and move to either a permit or a license. I think the law's intent, again, is that we are encouraging interpreters toward licensure, which would be, and in order to get a license in Alabama, you have to have um, a certified membership with RID, which would then mean, which is the Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf, which would then mean you have to have a national certification, you've passed a written exam, um, and in Alabama for licensure, they'll accept if you've taken the EIPA at a 4.0, if you've gotten a 4.0 or better, you can get licensure. And I just wanna make sure when I, cause I looked at it earlier to make sure, yeah, it's a 4.0 or higher, 
on the EIPA to get a license. Now, for a provisional um, on the EIPA, and I want to make sure it's a 3.0 to 3.9. Those are the options to get a permit or licensure. So to answer that question, from the state's perspective, the licensure board, they are just granting license, license to interpreters and permits. Um, when it comes to a school system hiring an interpreter, they're just looking at a license or a permit, most of them. I have noticed that in other states, some of them are requiring an EIPA, which I am all for. I think that's a great, because the EIPA specifically looks at the skill set of an educational interpreter, both in the written exam that they offer and in the assessment that they do. Um, and there is a new organization, relatively new, the National Interpreters in Education, that association, that organization is really setting up some standards for educational interpreters. And so I'm looking forward to that organization continuing to push um, higher standards for educational interpreters. But I, I don't know if that answers the question here in the state of Alabama, license or a permit, and you can work in a K-12 setting as an interpreter. All right, well, hopefully that's helpful. And uh, hopefully that answered your question, Andy. Looks like we're coming up on the end of our time here. So I do wanna ask if any of you in our audience have any questions, anything that has come to mind, anything that you would like to ask Ed or Chris based on their knowledge and experience, please do type those in the chat. But I wanted to ask Ed about pitfalls that you commonly see uh, people may not recognize or think about up front. Could you just touch on that? Yeah, well, the, the biggest bit pitfall is not taking the IEP process as seriously as it should be taken. Because uh, I'm not sure how periodically they come up. Is it every nine weeks? Is it twice a year? Um, or is it once a year? I'm not really, I'm not really sure, but it's a long time in between um, meetings. And um, while you can certainly write in and request changes, generally they're not messing with the IEP until the next IEP meeting. And so it's, it's really important to make sure that your, your child's needs have been identified in advance of the IEP. And you've come into that meeting armed with, um, uh, you know, the, ready to demand specific services that you think your child is entitled to. And to the extent that, that they may appear out of the ordinary that you've got some you've got some documentation to back up why you think your child needs needs to have that in the IEP. The other thing too, and, and, and I can't stress this enough, I mean historically Alabama in public schools have done a really, really bad job of educating um, uh, kids with hearing impairments. And there, is, uh, there are generations of children that have, or adults now, who have high school diplomas who are functionally illiterate because they just didn't get services. And, and I'm talking about more rural parts of Alabama. And I know the NAD has come, come in decades ago and litigated big cases um, to try and get more services for, for folks like that. And so it's important <laughs> to, to, uh, to keep that from happening by ensuring that, you know, your kids are getting, getting services and they're, and they're not just being matriculated. Um, and I've seen it even uh, in, in cases I've filed against um, some universities where instead of providing the accommodation necessary for a student with a disability to, um, uh, actually succeed in a program and learn and, and, and do well to where they can succeed in their job, that, that rather than make the investment in infrastructure necessary for that person with that disability to do well in that program, they'll say, well, you know what, we'll just exempt you from that requirement. Since it's up on the second floor and you're in a wheelchair and you can't get there, we just won't require you to do that. And so really what ends up happening is that person who's paying thousands of dollars in tuition to go to that um, you know, institution to get a degree is getting a degree, but, but they're getting less education. They're not getting what they paid for. And I've seen that at, at some, some of our most prestigious universities in this state. So um, uh, 
I wouldn't at all be surprised to see that same attitude in school districts. So that's why I really, really believe that the best thing you can do is be well prepared for the IEP and come in well armed with advocates um, to ensure that your kid gets what he or she deserves. Thank you, Chris. Did you want to add anything to that? Any thoughts? If I can, just a little bit. Um, just I, thank you, Ed. And I mean, really, again, the I, I I don't know the law anywhere near like you do, and so that's awesome just to have the law as the foundation. Um, and I think for parents, in particular, um, we talk about it in our school system with our interpreters that. Um, we want parents to have, um, you know, informed decision making. So when they come into the IEP, we want them informed and we want them to be able to make decisions appropriately and understand the difference between inclusion and equity. Uh, oftentimes inclusion is all about appeasing everyone. And I feel like equity is really transformative. That's when education is transformed for the student and for the other students around them that experience that part of what equity really looks like. Um, and and I, I just, you know, I encourage parents, like Ed said, to like know the IEP team and know what is written in your IEP and ask as many questions as you can. Like ask about everything that's in there. Because like Ed said, once it's signed, it can be changed, but once it's signed, that's what's followed um, day in and day out. Yes, and I would add as well, based on my own personal experience um, going through a deaf school, my parents were involved every step of the way, and I, I am just full of gratitude for them. And then upon entering Gallaudet University, the only university of the deaf and hard of hearing in the world, I found everything was fully accessible there as well. So when I graduated from there and then I went to University of Alabama in Birmingham, UAB, that was actually my very first encounter in a mainstream environment um, educationally, where I had to then encounter more taking these steps on my own uh, for accessibility and advocacy. It was an experience in ownership. And I want to encourage each of you as a takeaway to uh, share as that was a takeaway for me at UAB that I had to own this, my own advocacy and accessibility to take it upon myself to speak up and to be educated, to be understanding of what my rights and responsibilities are and to, um, to get the school to provide those appropriate qualified interpreters when needed to achieve my own educational goals. So I realized I can't expect others to do for me, but I had a responsibility in that to work with them to achieve the accommodations that I required. And if they weren't providing those, I had to, like I said, work with them to take ownership of my own advocacy. So whether it's parents with a child in a public school working at IEP, or in a university, whatever it is, we've just got to go for it, um, get that ownership, take that ownership and self-advocate. So for our audience members, I do want to ask if anyone has any final questions or comments, anything that you would like to share at this time, any last thoughts uh, before we close, now is the time. Does anyone want to share anything in the chat? Any final thoughts, uh, Chris or Ed? Any last tips or thoughts uh, that you would like to share or anyone from our audience? Uh, Thanks for including okay. I, I see, <laughs> yes. Uh, Dr. Jess, thank you for that. <laughs> We just had a comment here from Dr. Jess H. Go Blazers. <laughs> yes. And said, I also had to work alongside with my professors with the DBT. 
I'm sorry, DPT department to have my needs and accommodated accommodated to make sure that I kept up with my peers. Advocacy goes a long way. I agree 100%. And then we have from Andy, thank you very much. This has been very helpful. Ed, Chris, did you wanna share something in closing? Any last words? All right. No, I'm here, thank you. Well, yes, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ed. Thank you to all of our interpreters and um, to everyone who has attended this evening. I do also want to mention, if you are interested, we will host another ADA Q&A series focused on public accommodations. And that will address how to achieve public accommodations in the area of public services and accessibility with businesses. And um, that will take place the first Wednesday of next month. So cool. let me look real quick at my calendar and see, I've totally forgot the date. That is going to be May 4th cool. at 6.30 to 7.30. So we'll send out a blast again through adjacent space, our Facebook page. And if you're interested, we do hope that you will join us and we look forward to seeing you there. So thank you everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday and enjoy your evening. Bye-bye.